Imagine for a moment that after spending your entire life obsessing over internal combustion, horsepower, and gasoline, you've landed an engineering job at a prestigious car company. Let's say that company is General Motors, and you're at work, maybe whipping up some new version of the Chevy Tahoe, when suddenly, you get a call from the head office. The boss man tells you to stop what you're doing. Things are about to change dramatically. There's a war coming, a big one, and your focus at Chevy will no longer be on family-friendly SUVs. You're gonna make the engines for flying death machines in an effort to save the future of humanity. It's no secret that the global auto industry was turned on its head during World War II. From Subaru to Chrysler, nearly every major car company stopped in their tracks to help their respective nations during the horrifying conflict. But which companies were the biggest players? Which instruments of war did these industrial behemoths create? And when the dust settled, how did these automakers recover? To down past gas, we're taking a look at some of the car companies that made a massive impact on World War II. Past Gas Podcast. It's about cars, it's not about forts. This episode of Past Gas was sponsored by Valvoline. Did you know that Valvoline provides 24 times stronger protection against engine killing water contamination than the industry leading synthetic brand? I just found that out too. I think it's great. That's why I put Valvoline in my car and you should too. Thanks a lot, Valvoline. Welcome. As a man in my mid to late thirties, I am obsessed with World War II. <laughs> You, there's a, a few different paths you could take as you get older. It's either, it's World War Two, Civil War, which uh, is which is a little weird. It's a little weird if you're super into yeah. that. Because uh, uh, if, if you're, you're obsessed with World War Two, it's pretty obvious who you're rooting for. It depends. If someone's if you're, a, if you're an American, these days it's a little tricky. But for the most part, it's pretty obvious you're rooting for the good guys. If someone's a little too into German engineering, uh huh. That makes me worried. But I'm saying with uh, with Civil War reenactments and stuff, there's guys who are on the bad guy team, and they're like, that's the team I like. You don't see a lot of guys wearing the blue uniforms is what we're saying. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of the gray uniforms. Yeah, we don't do a lot of uh, Civil War reenactments in California. We actually, when I was in junior high, there was a week at school where like a, a, a Civil War reenactment like team would come to our school and camp out on the campus in tents they would live in these tents they had like their civil war camp they would fire a cannon every day yeah and it, <laughs> i wonder i don't know if they're still doing that did but you was, guys go and like knock on their tents and be like hey did you guys know that you weren't part of this <laughs> never did that no i think we we're kind of scared they were uh, they were all very scraggly kind of men they did really you, did you guys know that like california wasn't really even in this thing <laughs> I haven't thought about that in 15 years. Why, I want to get into that? Super Bowl reenactments. <laughs> I want to get like Bills Cowboys 92. Who would win this time? I don't know. That'd be a fun, weird. Yeah. Uh, I have like a knee injury. Niche. Yeah. Yeah. You're like, oh, this player had a knee injury. So I got to really commit to this. Welcome to the show, everybody. My name is Nolan Sykes. I'm joined as always by James Pumphrey. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the pod. We're going to have a real good time today. And Turn up the volume in your car. <laughs> Turn the bass all the way up because this is a hip hop one. <laughs> and that little giggle you hear is uh, our guest this week, Andy Paz. Hey. Paz? It's Paz. Paz. It means peace in Spanish. Oh. That's tight, dude. Yeah, Paz. Thank you. Paz be with you, bro. Thank you so much, uh, guys. It is an honor to be here. I am so excited. Um, I'm incredibly nervous. I'm fully That's sweating. Okay. Don't be you, nervous. You're, you're You've got the third great. man role. All you just gotta like chime in with. Dude, all quips. you gotta do is be extremely funny constantly. <laughs> okay, that's fine. I can yeah. do that. So yeah. Joe may or may not have COVID. Yeah, we don't know. We don't know. I didn't know that that was still a thing. I never believed it in the first place. It is kind of late in the uh, the season to be getting COVID. Don't you yeah, think so? Right? 
Maybe you just yeah. didn't want to come into work. What was yesterday? Everyone? Yesterday was Halloween. So oh yeah, what do people do on Halloween? Get COVID. Well, I watched Little Shop of Horrors. For those of you who don't know, Andy, he's a huge presence here at Donut. He designs all of the beautiful, beautiful merch that is available at DonutMedia.com. Uh, it's one of my favorite parts of our business. It's one of the most fun things to work on. Andy is responsible for all that. He's also a super funny guy and one of my best friends. Uh, Thank we, you so much. We hang out on the weekends. His apartment is very tidy. Thank you. And uh, <laughs> just two. He has two cool, very cool. Car, he has two very cool cars. He's got a Piero. Yes. And a uh, Mercedes SL. I do like that. Car. Classy guy. Dresses well. You audience are in for a treat. By the end of this, you're going to be Slime Nation, more like and Arsenal. I love that. Thank you so much. Yeah, I don't. I mean, Arsenal. thank you for the intro. It was really sweet. Um, I make the clothes. Yeah, we've been trying to get Andy <laughs> on this uh, for a long time. There's been some like scheduling conflicts, but you know what? Don't be surprised if you see him in more videos. Don't be surprised if you see him in more podcasts. Hell of a personality. Hell of a friend. Thank you. Without further ado, Nolan, maybe we should learn about Saab and WW2. Let's do that. And a lot of other... Oh, Andy, uh, do you have anything you want to plug? Oh, yeah. Um, I have two things I want to plug. So, guys, I come here during the day, right, and I make all the cool stuff for Donut. And then at nighttime, I do a reverse job where I give away all my graphics for free on my stream. It's called Spec Work. Um, so... If you want to come join my Twitch stream, I'd stream every night, like starting around five. S P E C W O R K. I've been on it. James has been on it. Jeremiah has been on Jer it. Jeremiah has been on it. Max has been on it. Nolan has not been on it. Nolan's not been on it. You did design a Zach Job shirt. I did design the Zach Job so RC recovery shirt, a uh, fan which is favorite. In one of the newest videos. Um, let's cut down to the brass tacks. Let's let's ask the hard questions, Nolan. Why aren't you on Andy's uh, Yeah, I've asked Twitch. him multiple times. You've asked me multiple times, but have not given me, hey, here's when we'll do it. Okay, well, you, I have a spot available tonight. Yeah, you got to understand. Yes. You got to understand, Andy. Nolan is like... Well, I'm, I'm one of those guys where it's like, if I already have a plan, it's very hard for me to like divert from that plan. You know what I, I mean? I totally understand. But like, if you give me like, hey, how about next Thursday? I got nothing then. That's perfect. All right. All right, let me set a reminder in my phone. All right. Let's do it. Okay. Look and at while that. Andy See? sets that reminder, let's dive we right in. We asked a big question, and we answered it. Guys, if you listen all the way through, um, there's going to be a very special surprise at the end where we will be doing an address reveal <laughs> of James's new house. <laughs> <laughs> I've always wanted, or not wanted, that's a weird thing to want, but like it would be fun to reveal our past addresses, uh -huh. and people could map out where we've lived. Yeah, they get pilgrimage. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know what's also crazy? Do you ever... I used to live on 1440 Curson... F in West Hollywood. On oh, the corner okay. of Curson and Was that your first place in LA? It was not my first place in LA, but it was the most fun. It was called Camp Hollywood. Oh yeah. Really? Andy, what was like one of your first places? Uh my parents' house. Should I do <laughs> okay, that? Don't, one? Don't, no, no, don't, don't. They still live there too. Don't give away your parents. Uh, uh, I lived <laughs> at, at one point, uh so this house in Curson was called Camp Hollywood mm -hmm. and it was just this big crappy craftsman house that you know comedians would rotate through yeah and at one point i wasn't doing too well with the acting uh-huh and i needed a place to stay. so my friend colton was like well you can uh set up a tent in my living room are you kidding colton done yeah so i lived in a tent for a little over a summer in a living room and uh the uh, <laughs> the uh yeah i was flying back of course I had Wi-Fi. I'm James mm -hmm. Pumphrey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, so he, sa he sent me a picture of me in the tent, and I sent him back a picture of my first class meal. Uh -huh. And I said, buddy, how far we've come. That's hilarious. Yeah, it was really cool. My friend one time lived in a store. He's like, dude, I live in this store. And it was in Hollywood. I'm like, okay, cool. And it was like. Like above it or like in it? I wasn't sure. He's like, yeah, come visit me. Like uh, me and my friends got this store and we're like selling stuff out of it. I'm like, okay. And I pull up to the store and it like looks like s just somebody's stuff that they have in their house. <laughs> I'm like, where's your room? And he's like, oh, it's in the hallway. I'm like, okay. And we walk into the hallway. And <laughs> he lived in a hallway <laughs> of a store. 
That's yeah. When that's you move rough, to a man. big city, you sleep in a lot of different weird places. How's he? How's he doing now? He lives in a van now. Shout out, Brian. Okay. Okay. Good job, Brian. Yeah. All right. That is actually kind of expensive to do now. You know. Yeah. Is it like a nice van? No, it's not oh, nice. Okay. Then never mind. He's going. Yeah. Brian, yeah. hit us up. Yeah, hit us we'll up. We'll start dude. a GoFundMe for Brian. Okay, let's get into it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> World War II. Here we go. For the vast majority of Americans during the 1930s, life was fantastically cruel. The Great Depression decimated the dreams of millions of families. And the economic fallout shook the country's institutions to their very core. The auto industry was no exception. By 1932, new car sales had dropped a whopping 75% since the crash of 1929, which led major companies like General Motors, Ford, and Chrysler to significantly restructure in response to the sudden fizzle in demand. Despite the chaos, GM and Chrysler actually did pretty well. GM didn't report a single annual loss during the Depression, and Chrysler only lost money one year. That's because both companies were aggressive in personnel cutbacks, increasing manufacturing efficiency, and adjusting their fleets to serve the struggling American population. GM pivoted away from their luxury brands and bolstered their lower-cost Chevrolet division, while Chrysler found success with their affordable Plymouth line. Ford, on the other hand, was slow to respond, with a combination of mismanagement, supply chain problems, and good old-fashioned stubbornness. We've heard a lot about this before. Yep. This is classic Ford stuff. Ford saw their market share tumble 12% by 1939. However, because the company was so massive, they were able to stay afloat. The same couldn't be said for smaller American automakers like Nash Motors, who either shut down or drifted into irrelevance soon after the war. By the end of the decade, the U.S. had clawed back to some semblance of stability. Despite a far from ideal 17% unemployment rate, most families in the United States had some kind of automobile in their garage in 1940. But along with the country's tedious recovery, there was serious trouble brewing in Europe. Germany took a shellacking in World War I, and as a result, the country spent most of the 1920s and early 30s in bottomless debt and industrial fallout. The citizens of Germany were desperate, and unfortunately, a megalomaniac fascist named Adolf Hitler used his countrymen's vulnerability as a weapon. In order to achieve their dream of taking over the world, the Nazis needed a ton of new equipment. In 1933... Hitler hired auto engineer Ferdinand Porsche, mm -hmm. yep, that Porsche, to design a low-cost car for the Führer's new state-owned auto company, Volkswagen. Within a year and at a time when only 2% of the German population owned vehicles, Porsche created the first concept Volkswagen Beetle. The promise of an affordable people's car, the literal translation of Volkswagen, was a major political win for Hitler and resulted in a significant increase in funding for national auto manufacturing. But almost immediately after the first Beetle was produced, the Nazis began cooking up far more terrifying vehicles. Because they were banned from mass-producing military equipment in the post-World War I Treaty of Versailles, Germany had to be sneaky about their plans. And sneaky they were. This meant much of their early war manufacturing was done in the same Volkswagen facilities where the Beetle was presumably being developed. During this gradual but massive building of arms, Hitler hired Porsche, yes, that Porsche, mm -hmm. again. This time to help design various weapon systems and several Panzer tanks, including the Panzer VIII Mouse Super Heavy Tank, the VK-451P, and the Elephant self-propelled gun, which was initially named Ferdinand after Porsche. Yes, that Porsche himself. Porsche was also instrumental in advising the Nazis about how to expand their mass manufacturing process. A lot of people say that, like, yeah, Porsche was, like, kind of involved, but, like, he wasn't, like, really involved with the Nazis. But, like, Ferdinand Porsche was super, super duper involved in the Nazis. Super de duper de duper de duper. Okay? Guy was really, really, really involved with the Nazi stuff. It's better to kind of acknowledge that rather than downplay it. Yeah. You know? 
Another group of Hitler's close pals were the folks at Mercedes-Benz. Andy, uh uh-oh, that's what we drive. Along with supplying the military with their famous engines, Mercedes built tens of thousands of Model 170 VK military vehicles, basically the German version of the Jeep, which came with Daimler-Benz 1700cc M136 four-cylinder motors. Based on the countless photos of Hitler riding around in Benzes during the war, it's obvious that he enjoyed them as his personal transportation as well. Hitler used five different heavily armored Mercedes 770K Cabriolet touring cars for his entourage, each capable of 120 miles per hour, despite weighing a staggering five tons. Jesus. Now, if you've ever seen uh, Indiana Jones 3, the one, the one with Sean Connery, Junior, <laughs> Junior, Indiana was the dog's name. <laughs> uh, that's what Hitler drove around. Also, Rat Race. Also, Rat Race. Two equally good movies. <laughs> BMW, there's a lot of cars that we like. (laughs) (laughs) BMW also had deep Nazi ties. Beginning in the early 20s, BMW and their majority owner, Gunter Quandt, that's a lot of consonants in a row, supplied the German military with legions of motorcycles, batteries, and some of the most advanced aircraft engines of the war, including a 41.8-liter, 14-cylinder beast called the 801, which was used in several Luftwaffe aircraft. In 1933, Quant became a Nazi party member and was eventually appointed leader of the armament economy. That's an early date to join the nazis like that's early on huh like 1933 is early to be a nazi yeah that's not like the war starting better do this for political purposes to protect my family that's like no like i like what these guys are saying yeah, i these guys got <laughs> some pretty good ideas i think i'm gonna buy some of their apes <laughs> <laughs> oh my god <laughs> The Germans were finally ready, and on September 1st, 1939, Hitler made his move. Along with Russia, whom Hitler would later betray, German military forces invaded Poland with awe-inspiring efficiency. With a wave of never-before-seen industrial power, the Nazis put the world on notice. But a nation that Hitler underestimated was about to create some revolutionary weapons of their own. A little nation that I like to call the United States of America, <laughs> you German bitch. Guys, um, I'm sorry I've been so quiet, but after hearing all this, like, you know when you see a picture of yourself and it kind of just like ruins the rest of your day? Mm-hmm. You know, I look like that. <laughs> yeah. I just want to let everyone, every single person that's listening out there know... <clears throat> I'm full Jew. I'm fully Jewish. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And um, I drive a Mercedes Benz. So yeah. I want to let everyone know that I will be doing a giveaway <laughs> on my stream. Of your Mercedes? <laughs> yeah, I'm giving it away. You're giving away your Mercedes. Huh? Yes. And also whoever else drives one here um, will also be giving it away. Um, and also if this gets how many listens are down? Three million. We'll give away everything too. And the the other car you have is a Mitsubishi. It's right? a Mitsubishi. Yeah, it's a Mitsubishi. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah. Let's keep that yeah. in mind. Yeah. Just we'll keep, keep that, that in mind. mind later on in the script. Uh-huh. Yeah. Because they built the Japanese built some stuff too. Oh, God. I'm gonna I'm gonna have to just walk. <laughs> yeah, man, you're gonna have to get a Ford Taurus. I mean, no, what did they Ford, do? Get a Ford you anti Semite. Are you kidding? Henry Ford? What can I have? I can have not I can't have anything anymore. You can have an artisanal bicycle. I can't have Zoo's bikes, Zoo's bikes. Shout okay. to Zoo's bikes. Shout out to the guys. Channel. Listen, we got to keep the lights on around here. Uh, this portion of this podcast is brought to you by Zoo's. They actually just gifted Nolan, James, and I five bicycles each. Yeah, I don't know where I'm going to keep them, but yeah, uh, I'm, I am thankful. I'm grateful. Okay, I'm going to put them all together and ride around in a chariot like Ben Hur. I'm going <laughs> to. 
I'm going to put them all together and build a mini house in between, and that will be my new car. Yeah, that's sick. <laughs> <laughs> Two motorcycles with a house in the middle. I like that you knew about that. He yeah. skates. Did you know that? Yeah, he's freaking good. I watched that it's last like night. It's like when you, that video. He skates of, with wit. Yeah, it's like that video of Owen Wilson that's not really Owen Wilson. And yeah, right. And yeah, right. But yeah. he's actually Owen Wilson. He yeah. actually does it. He actually skates. Like okay, you'll yeah, see I a did. video of Tim Robinson skating, and you're like, yeah, that he's has actually to be good. Else. I saw him do like a back crook on this one. What a segue. Do you know that feeling when your clothes fit just right? That's the Stitch Fix feeling. If you're anything like me, shopping for yourself is kind of low on the list of priorities, and I don't put a lot of thought into it. But I want to look good. That's where Stitch Fix comes in. Stitch Fix is the easy way to get clothes that fit you without having to endlessly scroll through options. All you have to do is answer a few questions about where you typically get your clothes from, what you like to wear, what your price range is, and they'll show you how to wear head to toe outfits. With your choices in mind and a wide range of sizes available, from extra small to 3XL, they'll find your perfect fit and send you clothes handpicked just for you. I actually did this a couple months ago. They really understood my style and even suggested some pieces of clothing that I would never pick up for myself. And now I have some new colors in my paintbrush, if you know what I'm saying. I love these clothes. Stitch Fix did a great job. So right now, Stitch Fix is offering my listeners $20 off their first fix at stitchfix.com slash gas. That's stitchfix.com slash gas for $20 off today. Stitchfix.com slash gas. Big thanks to Indeed for sponsoring this episode of Past Gas. Past Gas started as a dream to talk about automotive history that we couldn't do on the main YouTube channel, and it wouldn't have been possible without finding people who saw the vision and wanted to make it happen. To hire top talent who will share your dream and make it a reality, you need Indeed. Indeed is the hiring platform where you can attract, interview, and hire all in one place. You don't have to spend hours on multiple job sites looking for candidates with the right skills, when you can do it all with Indeed. My favorite part about Indeed is the screening and assessments. Indeed helps star applicants shine before the interview with over 135 graded assessment tests they can take from cooking to coding. And Indeed helps you see your top talents abilities in a flash by adding any of 135 graded assessment tests to your job posts. Makes things a lot easier, that's why I love Indeed. Indeed knows when you're growing your own business you have to make every dollar count. That's why with Indeed, you only pay for quality applicants that match your must-have job requirements. Need to hire? You need Indeed. Visit indeed.com slash passgas to start hiring now. Just go to indeed.com slash passgas. Indeed.com slash passgas. Terms and conditions apply. This episode is brought to you by BetterHelp. When you're working on your car, sometimes you get stuck. Sometimes you got to look in that repair manual, right? Well, guess what? Life doesn't come with a repair manual. So if it's not working for you, it's normal to feel stuck. Navigating any of life's challenges can make you feel unsure, whether it's a big career change, a new relationship taking form, or becoming a parent. It's great to talk to a therapist about your problems. It's just a listening ear, help you get through some of these challenges, which makes therapy the closest thing to a repair manual for an engine for you. I think therapy is super important. I think one of the best ways to get into therapy is BetterHelp. Plus, the best part of it is you don't have to go into an office. You don't have to wait in a waiting room. As the world's largest therapy service, BetterHelp has matched 3 million people with professionally licensed and vetted therapists available 100% online. Plus, it's affordable. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to match with a therapist. If things aren't clicking, you can easily switch to a new therapist anytime. It couldn't be simpler. No waiting rooms, no traffic, no endless searching for the right therapist. Learn more and save 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash passgas. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash passgas. Thanks, BetterHelp. Less than a year after the Germans occupied Poland, the Nazis successfully overtook most of Western Europe, formed the Axis powers with Italy and Japan, and were in a ferocious battle with Great Britain. Thus far, the U.S. had stayed out of the fray, but combined with the shocking growth of the Nazi war machine and ally England in serious trouble, President Franklin Roosevelt knew that America had no choice but to become more involved. A lot of American businesses were uh, involved with the Nazis before we entered the war. Just, uh, oh, yeah. Just say Including that. Ford. Yeah. And Firestone. 
Really? Hitler was like very uh, was a, a big admirer of of uh, of Henry Ford. Yeah, Henry, Henry Ford, Ford is like one of the only guys that he mentions in Mein Kampf that he looks up to. Because, Are you yeah, kidding? Henry no. Ford had like a whole book about how like it was like just total anti-Semitic screed. Are you joking? No. When did this happen? The, uh, uh, like 19, like 30s this was like 40s. early on, to, like nineteen ten and twenties when he wrote. Well, it. he wrote Mein Kampf in prison. Mm-hmm. I'm so. saying like Ford wrote that. Oh, yeah. Earlier. Henry Ford had a newspaper that he would publish with anti-Semitic articles. Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. Dude, what did we do? Honestly. Well, also, think about, at that time, like, the Jewish population in the U.S. must have been pretty small, too. And yeah. And only concentrated in probably New York City, uh-huh. right? Like... And like Encino. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> but, but Beverly Hills and, uh, <laughs> but I, I mean, I really just feel like I can't have anything anymore. And there's a new company added to the list last week, two weeks ago, maybe. Which one? Mm. Can I say? Yeah. Yeezy. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. yeah. We don't f- with Yeezy. Yeah. What we about, don't like that. What about Eve St. Laurent? Are they on that list too? Can we wear that still? I don't. I think so, guys. Let us know in the whatever <laughs> down below, dude. I got recognized twice at the YSL. Yeah, store. I heard. Let's run them through show. that real quick before we move on. So I walked into the YSL store. Uh-huh. I was on Rodeo Drive. That's where I'm at in my career now. And uh, the security guy goes, "Oh shit!" Hmm. and like gave me like a big dap and like a hug. And then he was like, "Ugh," and like went back to work. Uh huh. And then I bought my gala bag. No, no occasion. She's yeah. just a queen. Ah. She m- makes my life wonderful. And She's a queen, and that's how she should be treated. Yeah, and that's how queens deserve to be treated. Just found so, an yeah. article called, on, this is on MalayMail.com, saying, Revisit of East St. Laurent's 1971 Nazi-inspired oh collection. Oh, God. 71? That's not even in the war. But anyway, when I was getting rung up, uh-huh. another guy buying his wife a bag was like, dude, I love the channel. <laughs> you, like, thank you guys so much for making what you make. I collect cars. And I was like, I kind of collect them too. None of them work. But Damn. Anyway. Hmm. Okay, it's okay. The collection, which is alternative, alternatively titled Liberation, is inspired by the ready-to-wear styles of World War II period, specifically the clothes worn in Paris during the German occupation. So it's not like... It's yeah. adjacent, though. It's yeah. adjacent. It's adjacent. We could, we could semi-add them to the... They're on yeah. the... Um, we don't they're do, on notice. We, we don't on do notice. Hugo Boss. No. Why? Because they designed the Nazi uniforms. Oh, my God. Yeah. This is why, I'm not kidding, Nathan Fielder is doing God's worth with... Uh, God's uh, work. Summit Ice. With Summit Ice. Yes. It's the only brand that uh, acknowledges the Holocaust. Jay. Yeah. Yeah. And he did donate $150,000 to... Um, They're still up, of, like, it's still up and running. I kind of want to get one. Center. I want to get one. Really? Yeah. yeah. You know what? I know what I'm getting everyone in the office. This, Just uh, everyone's decked this out. This Hanukkah. Yeah. Okay. On December 29th, 1940, Roosevelt delivered a harrowing speech, harrowing speech, excuse me, dubbed the Arsenal of Democracy to the largest American radio audience in history. Quote, Never before since Jamestown and Plymouth Rock has our American civilization been in such danger as now. No nation can appease the Nazis. No man can tame a tiger into a kitten by stroking it. We must have more ships, more guns, more planes, more of everything. And this can be accomplished only if we discard the notion of business as usual. The one American business Roosevelt needed more than any other was the auto industry. With a combined economy larger than most countries at the time, car manufacturers wielded unrivaled manufacturing power. So, shortly after the Arsenal speech, FDR hired GM President William Knudsen to serve as chairman of production management. Knudsen. I think Bunky Knudsen's probably, uh, probably related. Knudsen, who immigrated to the U.S. from Denmark in 1900, worked at Ford and Chevy before his presidency of GM. So when he took the podium at the 1941 New York Auto Show, he had the industry's full attention and respect. Quote, Bombers, big bombers, are needed sooner than we dare hope to get them. Knudsen warned the Detroit executives in the audience, We must build them at once. You've got to help. The first half of 1941 is crucial. Gentlemen, we must outbuild Hitler. Get me Tony Stark's dad on the phone. (laughs) Note the time frame Knudsen mentioned. The first half of 1941. Keep in mind that while those fire and brimstone speeches sound like an American battle cry, 
the country still wasn't committed to sending troops overseas. The vehicles, engines, and weapons Knudsen initially requested from the auto industry were intended to support England and other allies. However, late in the second half of 1941, those numbers and America's involvement in the war would increase in ways no one could have anticipated. On December 7, 1941, Japanese planes, including the Mitsubishi A6M0 oh God. and yeah, Nakajima, aka Subaru B5N2s, led a surprise attack on the American naval base of Pearl Harbor in Hawaii. Yeah, and it would have been way worse, but all the Subaru spun rod bearings. <laughs> I have no idea what that is. I just know that's some deep cut car stuff. So I thought it was funny. It was a deep, deep cut. This attack was a brutally effective maneuver as U.S. forces were completely caught off guard and suffered over 2,400 casualties, along with a tremendous loss of battleships and other equipment. The attack on Pearl Harbor is one of the most significant moments in modern history. At the beginning of the war, the U.S. had the 18th largest military in the world. But even though the Axis powers were seemingly unstoppable, choosing to provoke the one major country that wasn't in direct combat with them, well, in hindsight, the attack on Pearl Harbor was a very, very bad idea. Do you think the guys that did the Civil War reenactment at your high school (laughs) stayed there overnight or did they like leave? I'm pretty sure they lived in those tents. Because this is what I'm thinking about as we've been reading this entire thing. <laughs> That's all I've been thinking about. If they like totally committed and they're yeah. like sleeping, I there. think so, dude. They didn't leave and like go stay at like a a Hilton uh, hotel, uh, Hyatt, Holiday uh, Inn. I dude, there was like horses there. They brought horses. Do you think that they sat down like Ken Burns style and wrote letters to their wives right. about their fake battle? Like, dearest Margaret. During third period, they had that square. <laughs> oh my God. They had that square pizza again. <laughs> I don't know how much longer I can bear it. Uh, and then their wives like uh, either read them or they're just like, "God damn it, Jerry! Can't you just play golf or some shit?" <laughs> yeah, for real. Imagine that was like your your thing you got into. Just just all in on some yeah. Yeah. So like imagine you mar- you date someone, right? Yeah. For years. You fall in love. Uh-huh. They propose. Yeah. You have a great wedding. Mm-hmm. It's been three years, right? You you got a a baby, you got another bun in the oven. Dude shows up decked out in gray. <laughs> that's okay. The, that's the Confederacy. Okay. Okay. Decked out in gray. And he's like, hey, this is what I'm about now. I'm going to pretend to do a war. I'm going to go live at Arroyo Seco Junior High School (laughs) for the next three days. Yeah, for the next three days, I'm going to go to uh, a high school in uh, San Luis Obispo. I'm going to sleep on the football field, and I'm going to pretend like I'm a guy who thinks that they shouldn't free the slaves. You know what? You know what's even... uh, I'll write you letters, though. (laughs) We had the square pizza again. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> you know what I like now? Good news, Margaret. Today was chicken patty sandwich day. The lunch lady gave me extra white gravy on my chicken patty sandwich. I think she's taking a liking to me. But don't worry, Margaret. My heart burns only for you. <laughs> they uh, they also did this during the week that like open house was. Yeah. So like all the dads would like go over to the civil war camp when they fired the cannon and everything. Oh God. They definitely, it was like deliberate, you know, they're like, yeah, hey. I think that maybe it was a recruiting drive. Oh yeah, it probably was. Maybe. And they're like, Hey, how did you get into this? And then it's like the new, the dads from last year are now doing it. Yeah. There's a new type of like uh war guy that I've been seeing on TikTok, And I don't, I'm sure you guys have seen this too. Mm-hmm. The guys that try MREs from like <laughs> oh, 1940. Yeah. Dude, yeah. Oh my God. Yeah, I like a couple years ago I went on like honestly a 6 month deep dive hole on there's one per- channel in particular. Uh-huh. And like <laughs> like so like uh tomatoes are acidic. Yeah. So if you leave it in a tin can for long enough it'll melt through the metal. That's insane. And like so this guy will open stuff up from like World War 1 and he just like opens it he's like, "Oh, uh, it smells all. Uh, it smells <laughs> awful. Uh, and then he like tastes. He's like, uh, uh, it's not good. Uh. They were trying beef stew from 1917. 
<laughs> How does that not get anyone sick? Oh, I was going to say, in elementary school, one of my classmates' dad, she he was like one of the commanding officers at this uh, uh, National Guard base uh-huh. in Tascadero. And one day he like brought our entire class a bunch of MREs and we ate them. Not like vintage ones, obviously. But did you guys ever do that? Did anyone ever bring that? I, no. I believe I've eaten an MRE, but I don't think it was at school. Yeah. We should have I MREs was, for lunch like this week. <laughs> I don't think we're that. I don't think we're that far away from it. <laughs> the attack on Pearl Harbor flung the United States into World War II. In response to William Knudsen's request, the American auto industry had already sprung into action. But the next four years would bring about some of the greatest industrial achievements the world has ever seen. By November of 1940, the U.S. Army received the first ever Jeep prototype from Ohio-based manufacturer Willys Overland Motors. Initially known as a Willys Quad, the heavy torque and durability of the Jeep was unrivaled at the time, which is why more than 300,000 Jeeps were produced from 1941 to 1945. South Bend, Indiana, home of Rudy. Uh, that movie is very misleading. That was the one movie my dad constantly made me watch. The only actually movie, the only movie I ever watched with my dad. Really? Yes, and he'd get me a copy every year for Hanukkah. Really? Yeah. I, watched- I'm, I have mad copies of Rudy if uh, anyone wants one. I do. Can you sign it? <clears throat> yeah, I could sign it and give it away on the pod. Can you sign yeah. it and give it to me? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. I have a new house to decorate. <laughs> South Bend, Indiana automaker Studebaker was already in the mix of World War II, having sent trucks to the Netherlands, Belgium, and France when those countries came under Nazi attack. As war production increased, Studebaker made engines, cars, and parts for the M29 tank. Many of Studebaker's trucks were so reliable that the Germans often took and commandeered them. Uh, Okay. Guys, I lost another Studi. (laughs) <laughs> 20 miles outside of Detroit, where Eminem is from, Ford created a production facility called Willow Run. Completed in 1942, Willow Run was the largest factory ever built and employed such a workforce that the government stepped in to fund the creation of Bomber City. I assume it's named after the jacket. Bomber jackets. It was a literal town made from scratch near the massive facility. Among other vehicles and mechanical parts, Ford's specialty at Willow One was the B-24 Liberator. Hell yeah, dude. The largest, most destructive, and eventually most mass-produced bomber in American history. With Ford's help, a whopping 18,482 B-24 Liberators were made throughout the war. William Knudsen's old employer, GM, received the largest contract of any company. The Cadillac division made tanks. Nice, dude. Cadillac tank? (laughs) Oh. Probably had very comfy seats. Dude, very comfy seats. Freaking probably had shove. It's on uh, Dayton's. (laughs) (laughs) Oldsmobile made bullets. Sick. And Chevrolet produced over 400,000 vehicles specializing in fire trucks and armored cars for the Brits. Oh, these are nice. Thank you. I'm imagining me in World War II getting into one of those tanks and be like, oh, did you guys see it's a Cadillac? Isn't that cool? And they're just like, shut the f*** up. <laughs> Buick, also under the GM banner, <laughs> produced armored <laughs> tractors, airplane components, and tanks including the most deadly tank of the war, the M-18 Hellcat Destroyer. Is that what they named the Hellcat after? No. I don't know. There's, Dodge. Well, there's also a Hellcat plane, too. So mm. Buick also had a hand in designing the most famous transport plane, the C-47, and made the engines used in the amphibious landing crafts on the beaches of Normandy on D-Day. You ever heard of it? It's when we went to France and we kicked those Nazis straight in their little strudels. My great uncle Bob drove landing craft at Guadalcanal. Hell yeah, dude. 
Did he kick some strudels? No, because the Japanese, they didn't, it wasn't a beach landing like D-Day in Europe. The Japanese, they held back famously in the jungle and up in the mountains. There wasn't any sort of like beach battle with these landings during like uh, the- They showed up in uh, uh, AE-86s and S-13s <laughs> on the two gay. Yeah. They came down. Hey, I, I have a question, and this is something that I've always wanted to know, and I could easily look it up, but- I waited my whole life to be on this podcast to uh, ask it. Okay. Who sets up all the stuff? Because, like, you know the movie um, Saving Private Ryan? I'm familiar. There's already shit everywhere. There's, like, bunkers. There's the, like, steel things. Like, Mm -hmm. who put that there? France. Or not France. The bad guys. Yeah, the Germans, like, they built all those positions. All those things are to keep us from getting on there. Oh, okay. I thought it was, like... Those are for them. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. Oh, they that's built the bunkers, this- and then they knew that like if they were going to land anywhere, it was going to be along that stretch. That stretch. So that <laughs> so that stuff was to keep us from just driving tanks right up on there. Yeah. Gotcha. But they were like, we put a bunch of jacks there and a bunch of barbed wire and stuff. Good luck running. And you know what we said? What? Thanks. Thanks for the good luck. Because I'm going to run up there and I'm going to kick your little strudel little ass. Off. You little strudel little punk ass. You think you're better than my friend Andy? You're not. You never even designed any Travis Scott merch, you <laughs> bitch. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, thank you for letting I me know. I hate that. Nazis. Man, this is getting me fired up. Same. I do, I wouldn't want to be in the shit, but know where I would want to be? Where? In the war room with that big map with all those chess pieces. Yeah. And I'm like, all oh, the boys, oh, maybe if we move all boys over here. We can cut off these boys over here. And they're like, Colonel, you're a genius. I would have changed my name from Pumphrey. I would have been James Colonel. I would have been Colonel James Beauregard. Masterson. I like that. Beauregard. Yeah. Beauregard. Pumphrey's too ethnic. Pumphrey? Yeah. James Pumphrey, I was imagining you in a World War II movie. I can see you as like a tank mechanic. The guy who's in like, <laughs> we got <laughs> Pumphrey's like a grunt name. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I gotta be upstairs. Yeah, I'm one of the guys upstairs. What would my What would mine be? What would your name be? Yeah. Well, I like. What would my last name serve as? You know, like you're the guy Andy upstairs. Pause. Yeah, it's Spanish. Well, you. Well, since you're Jewish, I wouldn't be in this situation. Since you're right? Jewish, you'd be down there, and you'd be scalping fools. I would, huh? Mm-hmm. Yeah, you'd have like a necklace of like scalps and fingers and stuff, and you're like, yeah, you want to kill in an Jews, Aztec too, war whistle? Guy? Yeah. Or a murder. Have you guys heard those? What the Aztec murder whistles? No. It's like this thing that the Aztecs used to use. Uh, this is completely insane that I'm even bringing this up. But it was shaped like a little skull, uh-huh. and the way that you blow into it, it literally sounds like someone screaming. That's it's sick. horrifying. Whoa. Yeah, someone would run into my into my war room, and they'd be like, "This pause fella is a liability. He's scalping all the Germans, beheading them." Putting their heads on sticks. And then I would say, you may refer to him as a liability. I see him as quite the asset. (laughs) You give that man whatever he needs. That boy might end this war for us. Thank you. Wow, what a compliment. Yep. World's first Navy SEAL, Andy (laughs) Paz. Oh, God. (laughs) I didn't say that. Call him Frogman back then. This episode was sponsored by Rocket Money. If you're anything like me, you probably have a bunch of subscriptions that you forgot about or just are too lazy to cancel. That's why I love using Rocket Money, formerly known as Truebill. This app shows all your subscriptions in one place and cancels what you don't want for you. Rocket Money can even find subscriptions you didn't know you were paying for. You may even find out you've been double charged for a subscription. To cancel a subscription, all you have to do is press cancel and Rocket Money takes care of the rest. That's great because I don't like canceling stuff. I'd rather just have a button like on Rocket Money, just press cancel, takes care of everything. That's why I like Rocket Money. So cancel unnecessary subscriptions with Rocket Money today. Go to rocketmoney.com slash gas. Seriously, it could save you hundreds per year. That's rocketmoney.com slash gas. Thanks, Rocket Money. Hey, remember when I was talking about Valvoline before? Well, it's true. Valvoline provides 24 times stronger protection against engine-killing water contamination 
than the industry leading synthetic brand. If you don't know what I'm talking about, when gasoline burns, it produces water or condensation as a byproduct of combustion. It happens to every engine, it's normal, but most gasoline contains up to 15% ethanol, which further increases the amount of water produced. Newer engine technologies like stop start and shorter trip can make it even harder for your engine to heat up enough to burn that water off. By the way, water is a terrible lubricant. Good thing Valvoline protects against that water contamination better than every other oil brand. And if all Valvoline oils exceed industry standards to provide the ultimate protection for every engine on the road, you can even ask our shop manager, Adam Knappik. Valvoline sponsors him. When you put Valvoline in your car, you are also protecting your car 24 times stronger against engine killing contaminants than the industry's leading full synthetic brand. That's why Valvoline's the best and you should put it in your car just like me. Thank you, Beverly. Soon to be president and even later to be on the the tiniest coin, the dime, uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower was on the beaches that day and said, there was no sight in the war that so impressed me with the industrial might of America as the wreckage caused by Andy Paz on the landing beaches. Sir, it's Paz. <laughs> it means peace in Spanish. It's peace in Spanish. It's like, well, he definitely caused the opposite of peace today, didn't he, gentlemen? Ha, 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 put me on a dime. <laughs> on the heels of their impressive achievements in manufacturing efficiency during the Depression, Chrysler got a government contract to design and build tanks. Similar to Ford's Willow Run, Chrysler built a factory from scratch called the Detroit Tank Arsenal, which is my favorite Henry Rollins side project. <laughs> By basically mounting five 250 cubic inch flathead six-cylinder car engines around a central shaft, Chrysler created the A57 engine for the M4A4 medium tank, a.k.a., you've heard of this one, the Sherman tank, a.k.a. the Shermanator, a.k.a. Stifler's mom. <laughs> the 30-cylinder beast produced an insane 470 horsepower, and the Sherman tank saw more action than any other tank during the war. I'm pretty sure that this is the tank that Shia LaBeouf and Bradley Pitt were in. Yes. And in glory. And Jeremiah, Jeremiah Burton. Burton. Jeremiah Burton, donut host, was in glory. What was Fury. it? Fury. Fury. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, he got cut out of every single scene, but he's, he's in still it. in you it. You can see his face in it. Wait, really? Yeah, they just cut all his lines so he didn't get royalties or paid. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, go check it out. We know paid? that guy. Not if you don't talk. Wait, are you joking? If you don't talk, you don't get paid. Wow. If you don't talk, you could be replaced with a with a mannequin. This industry sucks. This industry <laughs> rules and it pays your bills. You live way beyond your wildest dreams. By not getting paid. You get paid. You just said you don't get paid. You get paid. I'm talking about someone who doesn't Don't you get paid. get paid? I get paid. Okay, good. As you can probably guess, this overwhelming mass of industrial might was far more than the Axis anticipated. <laughs> yeah, you stupid little wimps with your micro, your tiny little strudels. I hate the Nazis, dude. I hate them. I hate them. Hey, and if you're a Nazi out there, fuck you. Don't yeah, believe for that. Real. By war's end, GM alone had made over 119 million shells and nearly 2 million machine guns. I'd like to get my hand on about a couple of those. In less than five years, their factories combined to make a staggering 97,000 bombers, 198,000 diesel engines, and 854,000 military trucks. Chrysler, too, had incredible final production numbers. Their tank output matched those of every Nazi factory combined. Take that! And they also built the nose of the most famous plane of the entire war, the B-29 bomber nicknamed Enola Gay. Hmm. 
That one dropped the atom bomb on Hiroshima, Japan on August 6, 1945, an event that effectively ended the war and changed the course of history forever. Uh, there's a lot of discourse on whether that was necessary or not. I tend to lean towards we probably shouldn't have done that. But, uh, you know, this is a, an open forum. The second so one was definitely not necessary. Definitely not necessary. Yeah, why did they do two? To scare the Soviets. But in, two in the same exact spot? Two no, cities. different cities. Two yeah. different cities. Yeah, so it was basically like war was ending. War was basically over. We were allies with the Soviets, but because of World War II, the United States and the Soviet Union had both become like ultra superpowers. Uh huh. And so, like, it was ine- inevitable that we were going to be, you know, wrestling for control of stuff. So, we had developed this like super weapon that just like annihilates cities and like ruins everything. And the there's a pretty strong theory that. Japan was retreating. Japan wasn't fighting anymore. Uh-huh. And we dropped those bombs on Japan to be like, oh, just so you know, Russia, we have these. Mm-hmm. So if you want to take that into consideration while we're divvying shit up, yep. uh, you might want to do that. Yeah. And now we have weapons that are more powerful by several magnitude, and there are thousands of them around the world. Thousands so. of them around the world. That's why I live. In a bunker. <laughs> <laughs> After nearly six years of catastrophic bloodshed, it came time to punish the people and companies who were connected to the Nazi regime. The treaty at Potsdam required the demilitarization of the German state, as well as the payment of reparation for damages. This meant Germany's car manufacturers were about to take a massive blow. Ferdinand Porsche, yep, that Porsche, stealing James's bit, was in serious trouble. From having Hitler as an automotive fanboy to helping the German war machine become more industrial efficient, the Austrian-born grandfather of the 9-11 was up to his ears in Nazi-affiliated business. And for his sins, Porsche was sentenced to 22 months in a French prison. Luckily for Ferdinand, his son Ferry Porsche Jr. and daughter Louise handled the family business while daddy was locked away and led the company to release their first consumer model, the Porsche 356, in 1948. 22 months. That's it. BMW, too, has had to come to terms with their unsettling roots. The Quant family not only made money from their manufacturing contracts, but also profited off of many stolen Jewish businesses throughout the war. Yeah, it's dirty. More than 50,000 slave workers were forced to work at BMW and other Quant businesses to help fuel the Nazi war machine. And in 1999, BMW became a founding member of the Foundation Remembrance, Responsibility, and Future for the Compensation of Former Forced Laborers, a.k.a. Slaves. (laughs) The company also stated that, quote, BMW bears a substantial share of the burden of responsibility for these events and undoubtedly incurred a burden of guilt in committing these crimes. Uh, hey, guys. Um, about that thing a few years ago... We just want to say, hey, our bad. We didn't mean to do it. Will we be giving the money back? No. Will we change our name or shut down anything? No. But it happened. And let's just buy, let bygones be bygones. <laughs> Both Mercedes-Benz and Volkswagen were so immersed in Nazi filth that several executives went to prison. All of Daimler-Benz's overseas assets were confiscated and then sold to help pay Germany's share of the post-war reparations. It took until 1951, six years after the war, for Daimler-Benz's operation facilities to be reconstructed. From 1945 until 49, Volkswagen was controlled by the British government. Soon after overtaking the VW auto factories and engineering intelligence, the Brits immediately saw potential in the soon-to-be mass-produced Beetle, and helped resuscitate the battered brand. The Beetle would go on to help kickstart the devastated German economy, and after four years of solid rebuilding, England transferred Volkswagen back to the new German government. Four years of solid rebuilding. You know how long I've worked for Donut? Seven. Seven. Mm -hmm. Worked for Donut for seven years. Mm -hmm. I've done zero genocides. (laughs) That's good. (laughs) Thank you so much. Yeah. (laughs) 
What happened to American car companies after World War II was nothing short of revolutionary. During the decades it took for Japan and Germany to economically recover, the United States auto industry led global innovation. This time period is commonly known as the golden age of American automobiles. For example, Willis Overland went on to produce consumer-minded Jeep models as well as trucks and station wagons before eventually being bought out. However, their Jeep is still World War II's most lasting and popular contribution to the automotive world. I mean, what about a motorcycle? I don't know about a motorcycle. I mean, what about a horse? What did Jeep originally stand for? General purpose. And then it became Jeep. And then they came out with one of the best videos I've ever seen, which is all the guys in that open top Jeep going over those whoops. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. You know, we all know what we're talking, what I'm talking about. That's a great one. When I was a kid, so my initials are J-E-P. Mm-hmm. And when I was a kid, my parents used to call me Jeep mm-hmm. or or Jeepy. That's cute. I'm gonna bring I, that back. I wish people would still call me Jeep or Jeepy. You know what? I want to start calling I want, you. You know what I want, Andy? What? I'm gonna hold you to this okay. because I know you're a good friend and you'll make it happen. Yes. I want you to call me Jeepy. Okay. And I want you to do it so much that everyone else does. Jeepy. Jeepy. Well, I was listening to one of the. Um, I've been trying to get people to start calling Zach Zeke forever. Yeah. It's not taken. I've. When? All the time. I, <laughs> Zeke. Okay. Zeke. Yeah, I've heard a that name. a lot. I've I've tried. Uh, Jeep. Call me Jeep or GP. I want to call you. Listen, and if you don't want this, I totally get it, okay, but I want to start calling you workshop. Teddy. Teddy, why? Teddy Pumphrey. Why? Because your Pumphrey. middle name is Edward. Yeah, which is short for te- or long for Ted. <laughs> Ted. <laughs> what? Yeah, so you go Ted, Teddy. Ted is short for Theodore. Are you joking? No. One of my friends is named Edward, and he goes by Teddy. <laughs> I also, cool. yeah, that's right. And then I also have Teddy's a friend. Too kinky. Okay, well, well, I guess we could like you know, especially we'll, like the way I look. Mm-hmm. You know, I got the beard. Mm-hmm. I c- I could afford to lose a couple of hundred kilos. I have another friend named Jack. And I recently just found out that his real name is John, and Jack is his nickname. Jack is a sick <laughs> name. Jack's one of my favorite names. But if your name, his name is John. Yeah. It's yeah. not Jonathan. Yeah. yeah. But he goes by Jack. Yeah. yeah. They yeah. called John Kennedy. Yeah. John JFK. Kennedy, they, they call him Jack. I cannot wrap my head around that, and I know yeah. how to like three D model and shit. I like know, I don't yeah. understand I know, that yeah. at all. I know. I know. You don't have to. You don't have to list your resume <laughs> unless you want. Should I? Yeah. I'll do it later in the comments below. Okay. The American automobile industry was essential in the Allies' victory and helped save the modern world from fascism, at least for a while. Things are getting pretty scary again right now. As Donald Nelson, head of FDR's War Production Board, reflected, the American war production job was probably the greatest collective achievement of all time. And I've seen NSYNC in concert. (laughs) Arthur Herman, author of Freeman's Forge, How American Business Produced Victory in World War II, said by the war's end, William Knudsen built the U.S. Armed Services into the greatest military machine in history. Knudsen went on to become a lieutenant general in the Army, the only American civilian in history to be awarded such an honor. Also, it should be noted that while they were a tremendous asset for the Allies, Ford and GM were also selling a boatload of supplies to the Nazis leading up to the war. GM was an integral part of the German war effort, said Bradford Schnell, who spent over two decades researching the company's involvement in the war. The Nazis could not have invaded Poland and Russia without GM. So next time you consider buying a Camaro or a Silverado or any other Chevrolet, Corvette even, ask yourself, do you want to be a Nazi? Hopefully, the answer is no. We've got some fan mail, you guys. That was a fun one. Not a fun one. <laughs> that was not really a fun one. <laughs> it wasn't a fun one, but it was a very interesting one. I, I love stuff like that. I love, like... I don't love war, but I think, like, especially, like, this time in war, this was when, like, technology first entered the battlefield. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, uh, less than 100 years before this, guys were riding around on friggin' horses, poking each other with sticks, Mm -hmm. and World War II was 
I think the point where technology surpassed war. Mm-hmm. Like we had technology developed during World War II that like we were we were like, what do we even do with this? You know, the atomic bomb is a perfect example of that. You know, I think during World War II and like testing and like the uh, uh, putting some of these weapons into practice, I think there was a lot of like, oh man, wow. Mm -hmm. That was a lot bigger than I thought it would be. Yeah, definitely. It's like letting the, you know, things that cannot be put back into the box. Uh Yeah, well said, James. And if you want to bond with your dad or your grandpa... Listen to this episode with him. Bring up, some MREs. Yeah, bring up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Get a couple of period correct MREs. <laughs> pop them open. Uh, get some cheer wine. Eat them MREs and listen to this episode with him. We got some uh, fan mail this week. Hi guys, my name is Otto Cardona, and I'm a huge fan. Your podcast got me through a very dark period of my life that I just got out of, and you were a very big part of keeping me sane and reminding me that I was alive. So forever thankful. Uh, However, uh, you're welcome, Otto. Uh, I'm glad that we could be there for you, man. Uh, however, you stated a couple times that John Davis is the creator of Garfield. That is incorrect. It's Jim Davis. John Davis is the guy from Motor Week obsessed with comprehensive gauge cluster packages in cars. Just wanted to let you know. Have a good one. Greetings from Puerto Rico. Regards, Otto. You're right, Otto. We messed up. Jim, I, we should all know that. We should yeah, all know I, that. I did know that. Yeah, we, Jim we Davis. have full back tattoos of Garfield. Of the entire Garfield cast. Yours, we yours split says, up the cast among us. Yeah. yeah. I've got normal. Yeah. You have, Andy has. My onesie. Andy my ha- Garfield onesie. Andy has a tattoo of a Garfield onesie <laughs> on his back. Um, and then I got stuck with Odie. Yeah, I was, yeah, yeah, yeah. But his slobber go down, goes down my butt crack, and it is very <laughs> ironic. Joe already had a Garfield tattoo, so that's why we yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. had to All right, it anyway. is Jim Davis. We did get it mixed up with John Davis. Sorry. Yeah. We, I, I'm actually very sorry. I am and, sorry. Uh, I'm going to go Harry carry myself. Thank you so <laughs> much. period, Craig, too. Yeah, thank you guys for listening to this uh, uh, episode of Pass Gas. This really is the the most fun thing that I get to do every week. Uh, as always, thank you, Nolan, for killing it. You read so well today, bud. Those uh, Hooked on Phonics tapes are really, really starting to pay off. Uh, I pretended to read. None of those words were real. None of that information was correct. And Andy. Yeah. Super pledge, bud. Yeah, dude. Check out Spec Work. And yes. Follow Andy yes. on Instagram. Spec Work on Twitch. Uh, I guess you can follow me on... Uh, well, I am doing a grid post sometime this year. Cool. But my Instagram is just Andy Brand, B-R-A-N-D. And if you want some free stuff, I will make it for you. Yeah, Andy Brand, he is posting a grid post at some point this year. Yes, I am. Uh, follow me at James Pumphrey uh, for a lot of Andy content. Follow Nolan across social media at Nolan J. Sykes. Follow me on TikTok at Kentucky Cobra. Uh, if you don't know, we have a YouTube channel. We uh, upload videos multiple times a week. Uh, a lot of them are really fun. Uh, we also make clothing that's available at donutmedia.com. I really enjoy it. Andy designs the majority of it. It's sometimes we collaborate on stuff and uh, really meld our minds. It's really, 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 really fun to do. It's not to make a buck. It's because we uh, we all love clothes and we all dress really, really cool. And we want to give you guys the opportunity to dress really, really cool. I love clothes. I wear them every day. Yeah, same, same. All right. Thank you, as always, to our producers, Christina Felski and. Nick Giamuso this week, so thank yeah. you guys. Uh, Gavin is uh, currently get tr- setting the world record for cryotherapy. <laughs> He's trying to do 12 hours <laughs> at negative 3,000 degrees. So if we don't see him back next week, it's because we hit him with a ball-peen hammer and he cracked like T-1000. <laughs> what the-